Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everybody. It's time to worship. Good morning. <laughs> so many familiar faces from downstairs. Uh, it's going to be a good morning of worship. Ernie's going to preach the word, and we'll have the worship music. If you're new with us, though, first-time visitor, we welcome you, always welcome you. Glad that you're here. There's visitor cards in the back of the pews or in the chairs. If you would fill one of those out, we'd love to send you more information about the church. There's a, a, a box on the door, just to the right of the door as you leave, and you can put that visitor card in there. We won't harass you. We will just reach out to you with a, a letter. and Anything we can do to help, the elders would love to speak to you if you, if you would like that. I'm not going to do a bunch of announcements this morning. You can look at your PPA. You can ask people. There's some sign-up sheets in the front. Because we're going to spend a couple minutes. Our uh, deacon of treasure, Ron Herm, is going to come up. We've been working on our 2024 budget, and we always like to just put that out in front of everybody. So we're going to do that this morning. He'll walk you through that. There will be a few copies of the budget in the foyer. And on January 7th, we will um, have a members-only meeting. So just in a few weeks, and we will vote on the budget because that's one of a couple things we vote on, the budget, and the reaffirming elders. We do that in January. So January 7th, you want to try to be here if you'd like to vote. But I'm going to have Ron come up, and then when he's done, he'll pray, and we'll uh, get on with worship. Okay, thanks, John. Um, I think Stuart's going to bring up a couple slides here, and, and there they are. Um, so we're just going to quickly go through our financial statements. There will be one page for our balance sheet. Uh, again, the balance sheet kind of shows us at any point in time where we are in terms of um, you know, our assets and, and liabilities. Um, we'll go through our operating statement for 2024, which is our P&L or revenue and expense uh, um, statement. And then our cash flow statement kind of bridges between those two. So hopefully help us understand what we have. So if we can go to the next sheet, the balance sheet. Um, you can see here we've got assets on the left. Assets, again, are what we own. So we really only own two things, our cash. You can see our cash balance in total across checking and our money market savings account is about 107000 And then our building. Remember, when we first purchased the building, it was uh, original value of like three twenty-five. You can see that is up because we've done some of the, the work to... Um, you know, fix the windows, we're working on the carpeting and, and stuff in the back, so that's increased the value and we've capitalized those, those uh, dollars. On the uh, right side, it shows us who has an ownership claim to our assets, so liabilities are if a third party has an ownership claim, and obviously the bank still has a claim on our, with our mortgage, a claim against our, our building. And then we have our, our equity section, which is what we own uh, of our assets. So you can see the mortgage, is sitting at about 130, 129.5. Um, and remember when we first purchased the building, we took out a loan of 260,000. So right now we're about half of where we were. And we have a plan, and you'll see here uh, in a little bit, that we're planning to cut that remaining balance in half again this next year with, with paying that down. So if we move on to our next statement, the revenue and expenses. Again, this is the period expense or period uh, statement for 2024 operations. And I've left 2023 budget in here just as a kind of a comparison. I think it's always kind of good to see how we're doing year over year. Um, and you can see in the uh, revenue section, which is our tithes and offerings, we're down a little bit versus last year's budget. We didn't quite meet the, the expectations that we set last year. So we're, we're kind of planning more at where we expect to end this year. So 346. Um, so, you know, kind of a challenge to all of us there. Um, and remember, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. So that, that will help us cover our expenses coming up that we'll see here in, in, the, in the bottom section. So in terms of expenditures, you can see it's going to go up a little bit from 277 from last year's budget to 302 in this year's budget. Uh, the main driver of that is you can see the leadership line change. So that's where, you know, our, our uh, pastor salaries and uh, uh, all you know, the insurance and, and that sort of stuff, payroll taxes, et cetera, falls in there. But as John has mentioned in the past, we're, we're going to add a second pastor or look to add a second pastor mid-year next year. So that's why we're seeing those expenses go up. So as the church grows, we're, we're prepared for that. 
Uh, you can see office and administration. This is where our secretarial uh, costs fall, as well as a lot of um, office administration, you know, like our rent on the copier, our, our interest expense on the loan. You know, we pay down the, the principal on, on the loan, which is on, a, on the balance sheet, but the expense piece, which is part of the period expense, falls in, in here, uh, as well as some of our accounting software and those types of, of expenses fall in there. Um, we can see on the operation of the property, it's going down year over year. Uh, we had a budget last year of 120, it's going to 92 this year. And I think we, we're seeing some savings as we've done repairs to the, to the building over the years. You know, we put a new roof, we've, uh, you know, put in new windows. So we're seeing some savings there. We're not spending, we, we don't plan to spend as, as much there. Um, but also in the operations of the building, let me just pull out. A little more detail, and if anybody wants to see detail, there'll be a couple copies that, that we put in the back on the, on the table in the foyer. Um, so in the operations of the building, um, you know, in addition to the, like the maintenance type expense, that's where our janitorial um, expenses would fall, all of our utilities, gas, electric, etc., as well as insurance for, for the building. Um, and then the other two categories are ministry and worship, and the missions and outreach is pretty much flat to, to last year, but um, I think missions is, is pretty self-explanatory, but on the uh, ministry and worship, that's where we have all the things like our, um, uh, you know, our ladies' ministries, our, our church fellowship, our benevolence fund, you know, special events, if we bring in speakers or anything like that, uh, our vacation Bible school, and all those expenses fall into that category. So that's our uh, operating expenses uh, compared to our revenue. And you can see we, we plan to have a net income of about 53000 uh, after we pay for those expenses. So that's still a good thing. And then if we move on to the cash flow statement, this again kind of bridges from our operating uh, financial statement for the year to our balance sheet, um, which is more cumulative across the years. So you can see the planned um, net income for the year, 53. And then there's going to be some um, items that we're going to use cash that doesn't flow through our period uh, operating expenses, not normal operations of, of, the, of the church. So we're going to continue to work on the project to, to change the, um, or replace the carpeting in the back, um, and some of the remodeling. So we're still finishing some, I think, by the end of this year. But 35000 is going to carry into the first quarter of next year. So we'll continue to pay that off. And then in the financing activities, you can see there, that's where our mortgage is. So we have our normal mortgage payments, which is like 17000 of principal we pay each year. But we want to, again, try to cut that down, uh, that mortgage payment down. So we're going to pay an additional 50000 next year. And in um, 2021, into 21 and 22, we actually paid 75,000 off early, so we're gonna pay another 50,000 here. So you can see with their income, 53 minus those things, we're really gonna spend more money than what we're gonna take in next year. So that's gonna eat into our cash balance that we have on our balance sheet. So as we saw earlier, we saw that we had about 107. That was as of this past week. I'm estimating about 110 is where we're gonna end the year in our cash balance, less that 49, 50,000 um, for the items we just talked about. We expect to end the year next year at about 60,000 uh, in our cash balance. So that's getting a little close to um, tapping into our reserve savings. You know, we had that money market savings account. So we want to try to avoid getting to that level if we can. Um, the next slide, just a quick reminder of what are the ways of giving. Um, obviously, our contribution box in the back is uh, the easiest way. You can also do online giving, but the only caveat there when we, we do give online, the church doesn't get 100% of, of uh, what you're giving because we have to pay the bank like 2.9% in, in bank fees for, for that. So, And then thirdly, if anyone has an investment account and you want to give straight from there to the church, church being a not-for-profit where we're not, you can avoid that savings of, of cashing it out and paying like a capital gains tax then you can only give the net amount to the church, where if you gave straight from your um, investment account to the church, you can give 100% of that, that value. So that is the budget. If anyone has any questions, you can see me afterwards. And again, we have copies in the back that uh, you're welcome to, to review. Um, so I'll go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll move on to the service. 
So, dear Lord, uh, thank you for bringing us together today to worship in this beautiful church that you have blessed us with. I thank you for the members of this congregation who so graciously give their time, talents, and treasures. And may we always be good stewards of those resources as we know all things come from you. And may our actions today and every day uh, bring you glory. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Please stand as we prepare to sing. I would like to read from Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Also, we'd like to go to New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist.
Good morning, church. If you would turn, uh, Genesis chapter 38. We're going to pick up our reading in Genesis. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He took her, went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kizeb when she bore him. And, jo and Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and rise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground, so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shear, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance of Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. Then Judah saw her and thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Then Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the, women's, the woman's hand. He did not find her, and he asked the men of the place, Where is the cult prostitute who was at Anaim at the roadside? And they said, No cult pr prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her my son Shelah. And he did not know her again. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this church. And Lord, I pray for the remainder of this service that it would be pleasing to you. 
And Lord, we just uh, pray for Ernie as he's prepared the message for us. Lord, I just pray it will penetrate our hearts, work in our hearts so we may go out in this world and shine the light of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
Good morning. Don't you love these Christmas hymns? Wow. Too bad this isn't a Christmas message this morning. <laughs> but next week, next week, pray for me. I'm preparing this message. I'm entitling it, A World Without Christmas. I don't know what I'm going to say yet. If you have any ideas, text me. Put them in there. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for these great songs. We thank you for the great plan of God from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22. But in the middle of it, you sending your son to die, to be born of a virgin girl, young lady, <clears throat> to, to grow and to live and perform all kinds of good deeds for people, healing, and then dying in our, in our place, paying the penalty we deserve to pay. We pray, praise you for this. Thank you. You're a great and awesome God, Lord, infinite, eternal, and unchanging in all that you are. We praise you for our people here. We thank you for all the folks that are here. Thank you for the great ladies' tea yesterday. What a blessing to see all these ladies down there. And we pray that you'll uh, be with those who are sick right now. We have a number that are sick, and uh, we pray that for quick healing. Pray particularly for Cinda. Thank you that she's doing so much better than she was. And we pray that she'll continue to recover. Pray for others that are not doing so well. We pray for healing and encouragement. Bless our church, bless our city, bless our country. Help us as a, as a people to turn to you in our time of need. We commit our time now to you. In your name I pray, amen. All right. We're in Romans chapter 12. This is the last Sunday morning. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 12, at least at this, from this pulpit. <clears throat> We've been here for a number of weeks, I realize. But it's great stuff. Jesus assured us that in the world we will have trouble. But he said, take courage, because I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. Sometimes the evil of this world can be beastly, monstrous, especially when tyrants rule and Christians are declared the enemy of the state. One church historian said that in the Roman Empire, with the persecutions of the Roman Empire, one-third of all Christians were killed. That would be about two million by the Roman Empire. Our own nation is coming close to the place of declaring Christians, domestic terrorists, enemies of the state, because we believe something outside of ourselves. We believe in God, in the scriptures, and we want to live that out. But that means that we face some evil. All of us face evil in one way or another. Sometimes it's very personal. Somebody just hates you. They just, some, for some reason, they've got it in for you. How do you respond to evil? That's the question I have here this morning. Do you overcome evil with good? Here's the story of one man who did. The first martyr described outside of Acts, Luke's Acts, was Polycarp. He was a beloved teacher in Smyrna, in Asia Minor, and they went to arrest him to bring him before the proconsul. They were going to burn him at the stake unless he re relented and repented of his Christianity. So the officers came to his house. This was around A.D. 155. He was born A.D. 69. So he was born before all the apostles were, had died out. But the officers came to his house where he was staying to arrest him. So he asked them, may I have some time to pray? They agreed to that. And so he had the officers 
He had a meal prepared for these officers, and they ate a nice meal while Polycarp was upstairs praying, and he prayed for two hours. (laughs) The officers were so struck by his kindness, they regretted even having to come to arrest this godly and venerable old man, Polycarp. But they did. They took him to the arena where he was presented to the governing authority. The governing authority, the proconsul, like a governor, said, Reproach Christ, and I'll set you free. Polycarp said, Eighty-six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and savior? He threatened Polycarp with beasts, animals, vicious animals. Polycarp said, bring them. He said, I've got fire. Polycarp said, I know of a fire you don't know anything about. It's a coming judgment, an eternal punishment reserved for all the ungodly. So when they prepared to burn Polycarp and wanted to nail him to the stake, he said, you don't need to nail me, for the, man who, for the one who strengthens me will enable me not to struggle. So standing there before Christ's enemies, he prayed, he ended his prayer with, may I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify your name along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, to you, with him, through the Holy Spirit, be glory both now and forever. Amen. They lit the fire. Somehow the fire wouldn't burn Polycarp. Now there's some traditions that go along with this story that you can read about. I'm not going to tell you about them. But he wouldn't burn, so the executioner just stabbed him with a dagger, and that was the end of Polycarp in this world. But Polycarp returned good for evil, and he glorified God through his persecution. How would you respond? Would you have fed the officers? What if you were Joseph down there in Egypt, and you had all the authority to go up and whack those brothers of yours that so viciously treated him and sold him into slavery? When they finally came down there to Egypt, you remember, rather than Joseph having them all executed, which he could have done, he fed them all. He fed them sumptuously. When it was all said and done, his brothers were afraid of him, and they came to him, and he said, don't worry about it. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And he spoke kindly to them. How would you respond if you were Joseph? Returning good for evil. Now, last week, we looked at the first three uh, steps here, points in Romans 17 and 18. I just want to review them real quickly. Romans, 17, Romans 12, 17a says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. So filled with the Spirit of God, the glory of Christ, through godly strength, We must refuse to return evil for evil. That's an absolute command. That's not a suggestion. And uh, it's a sin to return evil for evil. We illustrated this with David's treatment of his enemy Saul. You remember Saul burning with jealousy, chased him all over the wilderness. Twice David could have easily dispatched him and killed him but he didn't. Romans 12, 17b, number two, respect what is right or good in the sight of all men. God says we're to plan ahead. Plan ahead to do good to your enemies. You got somebody that hates you? Think about it. How can you do good to him? Plan ahead what is good, what is right. Jesus said if they tell you to, if they force you to to carry a load for a mile, plan ahead, be ready, carry it two miles. Remember that? Matthew chapter five. Sermon on the Mount. Third one, Romans 12, 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. With the power of Christ in us, we belong to Jesus. 
His Spirit is filling our lives. We're to do everything possible to make peace. It's not always possible. We talked about that last week. We never make peace with wickedness or sin or evil or heresy. But the point is, don't live in reaction to people, but in response to God's good grace and wisdom. You may not be able to change that person, but you can change and you can treat them in a, in a, in a way that honors the Lord. Don't be a troublemaker. Refuse to fight fire with fire. That's what Paul is saying there. Now we come to the, this morning, the last three steps in verses 19 to 21. Let me tell you ahead of time in case you get nervous. The first point is longer than the second and third, okay? At least twice as long, so hang in there. Number four, godly strength lets God take care of the injustice. This is really important for us. Verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. What a great statement. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I want you to notice that Paul addresses these people with the very endearing beloved. You see that? Beloved. Why does he say beloved? I don't think he used that in this whole chapter. Well, Paul knows that God's people are going to face hard times. It's going to be hard. Whoever lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So he, he talks to them as a loving apostle and brother in Christ. His heart is for Christ, and he talks to them in an endearing way. He wants them to know that, yes, persecution is on the horizon, but we can't, and we, and we naturally want to take justice into our own hands. So if someone does evil to us, what do we do? Do we go after them and do we punish them for that? If the state declares the church domestic terrorists, do we form up an army so that we have Evansville Bible Army and we have practice with guns and cannons and machine guns you know remember Jesus he said if my kingdom were this world then my 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 uh, fellow my believers my people would fight if my king it's not our kingdom is not of this world and there, here you have in verse 19 again another absolute never so when should we take our own revenge never, never. That's what it says. That doesn't mean that there isn't going to be justice. Oh, there'll be justice, all right. But notice who is qualified to bring the justice in this verse. Leave room for the wrath of God. When you pull into a company, business, there's one space with this sign reserved for the president, okay? Don't park there. That's not your parking space. Well, there's one sign reserved for God Almighty, and that's wrath. Don't park there. That's what J. Adams illustrates it like. Bringing wrath is God's business. He has the right and he has the authority, the power to bring perfect vengeance, perfect justice. We don't. So stay out of God's parking space. Paul is quoting there Deuteronomy 32, 35. Listen to this. I don't think, I don't think we have it on the screen. Vengeance is mine and retribution. That's pay. That's pay. I will repay. Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time, the whole point here is, do people get away with anything? Do they get away with murder? Does Hitler get away with it? No. 
There will be justice served. That's just not your business to serve that justice. So this verse 32, 35. Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near and the impending things are hastening upon them. That's an awesome verse. Vengeance, and God hasn't changed. He is the same God today as he was back there in Deuteronomy. When it seems the wicked are getting away with murder, notice, in due time their foot will slip. Just want to let you know, that is the basis of Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. In due time, their foot will slip. The day of their calamity is coming. But for God's people, you and me, we know that God will bring justice on all evil. He either already brought it at the cross when Christ paid for our evil. He brought good in place of our evil. Propitiation. He satisfied the wrath of God on that cross. And we know he's going to bring eternal punishment on all those who refuse to repent and receive his son. But here in this text, Paul's point, as much as we would like to wreak wrath on our enemies, that's God's business. God isn't talking about our responsibility to defend ourselves now. We mentioned last week, you remember this. Be careful. God's not a mamby-pamby God. And... He has certain authority structures. I'm going to share these with you in just a moment. But do remember, God's not talking about not defending ourselves or our family. The Second Amendment. What a wonderful amendment that is for, the, for America. The right to bear arms because of the tendency of tyrants to want to take Total power. So we have the right to bear arms. And we have a right to defend ourselves. You know, I've got a pistol beside my bed. So don't you dare try coming in. It's right there. The problem with me is, though, I'd be like Barney Fife. <laughs> you know, I, I'd probably hit everything but the bad guy. But if someone rips off, rips you off, don't go slicing their tires. Report them to the authorities. So that guy, you may have heard, read the news this week down in very center city Philadelphia, Macy's there. This dude comes in and tries to steal some stuff and the security people catch him and get the stuff back. They should have called the police and the police should have arrested the guy immediately. Instead, they let the guy go. Well, their security, the guy comes back with a knife and kills one of them. Sad story. Now, think with me here a little bit. How does God execute his justice? He uses ordained authorities. I'm kind of going to an excursus, a addendum here. How does, he, how does he execute his justice? Number one, through the family. When children do evil, guess who's responsible to take justice? Dad. Kids, you can't say, oh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You can't touch me. Oh, no. God ordained that dads and moms take care of justice. If the school system wants to make transgender or other sexually perverted material available to your children, you're responsible to protect your child. So there's that sense of authority. A father. One day I was working with my dad in our market, play, market business down in Center City, Philly, and I went to this lady. I don't know. She got up on the wrong side of the bed that morning. She's, I went up to her and said what we always say. May I help you? I was just young. She said, well, you can just go you know where. 
said, what? So I told my dad. She just said, he comes up to her and she says, he says, if anybody's going to go, you know where you are now. How can we help you? And you know, my view of my dad just shot up, man. I'm telling you, you, you do it, man. Good for you. Go. There's authority. There's authority in the family, even in business. An employer, a Christian employer has the authority to fire. Somebody's not doing the job. There's justice involved there. There's the church. When a professing Christian persists in evil and sin, the church is responsible to discipline the person. Matthew 18, it's called church discipline. You bring the unrepentant, professing Christian to account for their sin. If they refuse to listen, ultimately you remove them from the blessing and protection of the church. And Paul describes it as being turned over to Satan in 1 Corinthians 5.5. And of course, there's the government. The government is God's main instrument of inflicting his wrath today. God, we're going to see this in January because we're not, going to, we're not getting to Romans 13 until January. But God is able to, to execute his wrath personally. Even in Romans chapter 1, he is executing his wrath right now. The wrath of God abides on all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He turns people over to their own persistent and perverted sins. And you see God's wrath. We saw it even this morning. God, in, that, in the reading that um, brother, what's his name? Phil. Phil. Thank you, Phil. He read it this morning. You know, God struck down those two boys. I believe it was two of them. That's God's wrath executed. God struck down Herod in, Hebrews, in uh, Acts chapter 13. Because he, or... 12, I believe it is. He was praised, the voice of a God and not a man. And he took that glory and God sent an angel and struck him with worms. And God can strike down people whenever he wants to. That's his prerogative. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. This is the whole purpose of government to restrain evil and encourage good. It's a travesty when governing authorities allow thieves and pillagers and murderers go free. So, but the church is not called to form a standing army. Now, this takes me to our war of independence. Should we join the resistance to the governing authorities when there's a f- whole movement to overthrow the current government? Would you have joined in the war of independence? There were some pacifists who didn't join, but there were others who absolutely joined. How do you know the difference? I don't know. Pray about it. If there's a movement like that, we're going to have to talk about that, see what we're going to do. I don't have a clear and simple answer on that. But then finally, though, God knows how to execute his wrath eternally. There's an eternal wrath coming on all those who hate God. Every human being will stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20, and be judged according to their works. And every Christ denier will be thrown into the lake of fire. A horrendous thought, but true. That's God's vengeance. That's God's wrath. That's God's judgment. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So here in our verse 19, God is talking to believers and forbidding personal revenge, personal retaliation. This is when you've been mistreated, you have an enemy who somehow is trying to make life miserable for you, and you'd love to even the score, because that's part of us, justice. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, quote, this is perhaps the greatest demand that is ever made of us. It's true. You just want to get even. I can't let him get away with that. You want to pay the guy back on the spot. One more story from David. One day, David sent 10 of his men to ask a wealthy farmer for some provisions for David's little army that he had there. Uh, Nabal, the man, the the wealthy uh, farmer, 
landowner, refused and scorned David's men. David flew into a fearful case of ancient road rage, I guess you could call it. He strapped on his weapons. He got his men together, and they headed out not only to take out this fool, Nabal. That's what his name means, fool. Never name your child Nabal. I bet you don't even know of a Nabal. No one. Has, does anyone know of a Nabal? That would be, that would be not good. Don't, don't do that. Nabal, the fool. David's coming, man. He is riding his high horse. He's got the guys with him. He's going to take out Nabal and his whole household. Well, one of David's men <clears throat> went up there and talked to Abigail. Remember Abigail? Very beautiful and wise lady. The wife of Nabal. Why did she marry him? I don't know. David, Abigail said, don't take your own revenge. You'll be sorry. So David wisely listened to her. Within 10 days, guess who was dead? Nabal, dead of a heart attack. God knows how to take care of our enemies. If David would have taken him out, that would have been a mark against David. Jerry, uh, Bridges, Charles Bridges, his book in, on Proverbs, he said, no man ever conquered his enemy's heart by revenge. Good to remember that. Number two, that was my long point. Number two, godly strength finds ways to meet the needs of your enemies. This is just amazing. But if your enemy is hungry, so don't take your own revenge. That's God's business. That's his parking space. Just let God handle that. But there's something you can do and you should do. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Wow, what an interesting verse. So you haven't returned evil for evil. You've planned ahead on how to respond to evil. You've done all you can do righteously to bring about peace. You've let God deal with the situation, the injustice of it. Now what? What do you do now? You don't stop there. It's not just negative. It's not just don't return evil for evil. There's something positive here. What do you do? Is he hungry? Feed him. Is he thirsty? Give him a drink. That's what God says. You look for ways to bless this person. What would be a great gesture to that person that, for some reason, they've got it in for you? Buy him a gift card. You know, I don't think my neighbor was angry at me, but I accidentally put my shovel in the ground behind our house there and cut right through his cable. Internet service, cable service. That's not a good idea right there. <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> Gave him a gift card, sent him a gift card. Do whatever you can to feed him or give him a drink. Maybe here's a good idea. Listen carefully. This is very technical. Give him a plate of Republican cookies, <laughs> especially if he's a Democrat. <laughs> Have you ever had Republican cookies? Has anybody ever heard of Republican cookies? Well, I, I'm here to tell you that we have a plate of Republican cookies or a container of Republican cookies in our freezer, and I'm enjoying them. They are delicious. Say, what are they? Well, ask, when Tom Simpson gets back, he's not feeling well. Ask him, what are Republican cookies? Because he's the one that told us about them. So you give this guy a plate of Republican cookie, not just one. You give him a plate of it. <clears throat> and then uh, the Bible, the verse here says, in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Heap. See that word heap? That means you don't just hear. Huh? You know, you're in McDonald's and some guy's feeling bad or something. He's a miserable dude. And, and he says something nasty to you. You don't just go, hey, hey, fella, have a fry. Have a French fry. That's not heaping. He, you want, what you want to do is you want to, hey, man, I'm sorry. Did I do something? If I did, I'm, I'm sorry. Here, have a Big Mac and a chocolate shake, not just one French fry. 
You heap, heap. So it makes a statement. Did you all get that? This is exciting. This is in Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. That's what it says. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Your enemy. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Where did, David, where did Paul get his verse? Right from Proverbs, right there. There it is. You say, what does that mean, heaping burning coals on his head? Well, Jay Adams has a book, How to Overcome Evil. It's a little booklet. It's very good. <clears throat> and his idea is, in the old days when they were defending their walled city, they would heat up coals up above. You know that they heated up oil, too. They used oil. But when the enemy was trying to breach the walls of your city, you would dump these burning coals on his head, and you would neutralize him, and he would go back down. You'd, over, you'd conquer him. It could mean that. It could be that. Or it could be coming from an Egyptian tradition of a guilty person carrying coals on his head as a symbol of shame and reproach. Either way, either way, the idea is to overwhelm your enemy so much so that he, he thinks, he thinks, oh my goodness, how stupid I was, how ignorant I was to say that to that person. And you, and you reduce him, you bring him to kindness. You bring him to maybe repentance, who knows? God may use your acts of kindness to bring conviction of sin to his heart. He may bow his knee to Christ in repentance. But, but that's God's business, of course. Our business is to obey God. There is a story, I believe it's a true story, of an army officer who scorned a private who would pray outside of his tent. He would pray, and this army officer one day came in with muddy shoes he went over there where the private was praying and he whacked him on the side of his head. The private went right on praying. The next morning, this is supposed to be a true story. The next morning, the officer found his muddy shoes all cleaned and polished. That's returning good for evil, right? And the story is that the guy said, that's how I became a Christian, by that private's act of kindness to me. So God may use your coals to that person in your life that seems to have it in for you to reduce his heart, to bring conviction of sin to his heart. Lastly, godly strength determines to be an overcomer in the name of Christ. An overcomer. Do not, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's not just don't return evil for evil, but it's don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is, this is brilliant. Paul is brilliant here. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he knows exactly how to end his argument, and he does it with this simple little verse. Powerful. He is calling us to be conquerors of evil, not victims of evil. We belong to Christ. He is the overcomer. The word overcome is the Greek word nikao, Nike. You've all heard the word Nike, overcomer. Every time you see the Nike swoosh on a sweatshirt or sneakers or hat, remember that message that's a symbol a message that you and I as Christians are overcomers we overcome evil with good we're not victims we have the power of Christ within us I think that's what Christmas is all about God overcoming evil with good with Christ paying that penalty. He conquered evil for us. He defeated death and the devil. Evil may seem to carry the day for a short time. It is right now. 
But if it's personal, like with Polycarp, what happened to Polycarp? When that guy finally stabbed him and he finally did die, what happened to him? We've got to remember this, the eternal view, the eternal perspective. He, he went into the Lord's presence. I'm not looking forward to that kind of persecution, but I've got to remember, if it comes down to death, we get to go to be with Jesus. We've got to remember that. We're overcomers. We're not victims. In Christ, we've overcome. So what is God's will? Not just to hold off evil, but to overcome evil with good. And behind every command of Christ, he includes his power to obey. So figure out the needs of your enemy and overwhelm him or her with the love of Christ. Concretely, a letter of understanding and assurance of your love for them, maybe. I just got some examples here. A plate of his favorite kind of cookies. Maybe he doesn't like Republican cookies once he finds out what they are, whatever they are. Take him to lunch. Pray for her. If it's a lady, could be a lady. Her and her family. Express appreciation for their diligent work. Conquer evil with good. That's the whole idea here. Don't be a victim to your circumstances. John mentioned this this morning. We don't just react to our circumstances. We respond in the power of God like Christ did. And really, only people with Christ's power in our lives can we live this like this. I mean, you're not going to live like this if you don't belong to Christ. While Paul is sitting in prison in Rome he wrote the book of Philippians and he it's it's a book of joy it's a book of joy he's not a victim he's a prisoner but he's not a victim he's the hero not Nero and he writes Philippians rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice and he adds this really great verse as a prisoner I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me now, that applies to everything in our lives, but it especially applies, how do we deal, how do we respond to evil? How do we handle it? Are we able to say, instead of getting angry, mad, telling them, giving them a piece of your mind you couldn't afford to lose, return good for evil? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. This, this material is especially... Pertinent when we are feeling the heat of evil, when we are feeling the, the pain of evil. Lord, there well may have, have here people whose own family says mean things, says ugly things. That would be evil. It's wrong. Help us, Lord, all of us, to respond like Christ did. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They need to be saved. Use our good things, our good deeds, our good responses to work in their hearts to bring about conviction. And Lord, if there be anyone here who's not yet surrendered their heart to Jesus, Lord, bring them to yourself. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Please stand.
We thank you, our Father, for a great reminder that we are your children and we should act like you. you calling us. You said, be perfect as your Father is perfect. Father, we know without your grace and your help and assistance of your Spirit, we not be able to forgive our enemies. But this is what you're calling us to do. Father, use us even this week. There's people you bring into our lives to grow us, to show your love. Help us, Father. We ask all those things in your name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.